and hand it off to June. We have audio off. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't say that. <laughs> it happens at least three times. Welcome, everyone. June, if you want to do introductions. Yeah. Um, we'll go. Be right back. Hi, everyone. Um, Hope you all can hear me. Um, I see many of your faces online. So welcome to a special meeting for the Government Transition Advisory Committee. Um, today we're going to be doing a training hosted by the Office of Equity and Human Rights um, between 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and so this workshop is being recorded um, so that folks can um, watch this after it is just So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, in terms of our Zoom overview, we'll have closed captioning available. Um, and we uh, will have committee members, please change your chat settings to everyone. And then community members who are present can submit questions um, or thoughts in the Q&A. Although since this is a training, we'll probably um, sort of leave that um, to the side and maybe address those at a, a later point. And then in terms of meeting information, I just wanted to kind of ground us all in, in why we're here today. Um, you know, this isn't only a requirement in the GTAC community engagement plan to, to support culturally responsive engagement, um, but GTAC has a commitment to um, reaching Portlanders about our new form of government. And this training is, oh, if you don't have everyone today, Jose, I think that is fine. Um, that we want to be able to do um, engagement around this new form of government that is more inclusive. Um, and so as, as folks from GTAC are doing engagement as well as staff, um, it's sort of a good grounding to be able to do, to talk about equity and community engagement. So thank you um, all for being here. Um, I also wanted to let you all know that the agenda slides and some resources from OEHR are posted on our event webpage, and so you all should have the link. Um, but for folks from the community, you can navigate to that um, from our website. And so um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right there um, and then hand it over to Yolanda from the Office of Equity and Human Rights, who's going to lead us through our training. Um, Oh, actually, you know, I'm wondering, should we do a, 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 introductions would be great. Yes. And I know I'm so happy to see you, Joe. And can you make us, uh, can you make Jamila a, a panelist as well? Yeah, let's do that. Um, maybe we will start with introductions of GTAC members in the room, mm -hmm. and then we'll do it online. And then I'll, I'll hand it over to you all um, at OHR. So maybe we can start with you, Julia, and then go all the way to Leah. Uh, my name is Juliet Hyams, so I use she, her pronouns, and that's it. Is there any information that's useful in the introduction? Is there more? I think in the, if there's anything you want us to know, we're happy to know it. Okay. Um, my name is Amy Randall. Um, I also use she, her pronouns, and um, we're grateful that you guys are here uh, and excited for what you have to share. Thanks, us too. Hi. Hi, Zach Carl, UC Hempronauts. Joe Hertzberg, a member of the committee, and um, I really appreciate the materials that were attached to the invitation. Great. We have that sent the she, they pronouns. Thank you so much. Great, and we'll go online. Maybe we can go to Jane, Zach, and then Jose. Oh, Jane, I caught you eating. Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, you are muted. Oh, still muted. Still muted. <laughs> oh, so embarrassed. Hello, I'm Jane DeMarco. I use she and her pronouns. Um, thank you, Yolanda, Yamilia, and Judith for doing this for us. I am very appreciative and excited to learn something new. It's the Blake White Zach. Oh my goodness. Um, a trick question. Can we go to Jose? Hi, Jose Gamero. He his pronouns. Um, Glad to be here. I'm glad we're doing this. Great. 
And then we'll go um, William. Okay, hi, uh, Bill Kennedy, and uh, looking forward to the training. Uh, he, she, he, he him. <laughs> uh, Terry Harris, he, him, uh, looking forward to it. Hi, Lori Heffley, um, I use she, her pronouns. Thank you for being here tonight, looking forward to the training. And last but not least, David. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if, I, if there was anybody else to go. Uh, name is David, he, him pronouns, and I'm glad to be here as well. Thanks, David. Um, and we'll pass it over to Yolanda. Yeah. I like the excitement of <laughs> <laughs> and the welcome. Um, I am Yolanda Sanchez. I'll be one of your trainers today. I uh, use she, her, and Asia pronouns. Uh, Aja is in Spanish, and I'm multilingual, Spanish and English. Um, I represent the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Um, one of my primary roles is to uh, develop equity uh, training and education, um, as well as facilitation. And um, I'll be giving this training today with two of my wonderful colleagues, um, that are going to be introducing themselves next. Good evening, everyone. You have to turn the mute again because there's a mic in the Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Sorry about that. I'm, I'm Jamila Osman with, with the Office, Office of Equity as well. Um, one more setting that's picking up. Is it turn your speaker off as well? No, <laughs> Next. <laughs> nice. I'm like scared to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for your patience. Um, Nicole did warn about that and it happened anyway. So we're only human. I'm Jamila Osman. I'm new to the Office of Equity. I'm really excited for this training tonight and to get to spend the evening with all of you. Yes, and thank you so much. And um, my name is Judith Lowry. I'm currently the interim deputy director for the Office of Equity and Human Rights. And I use she, her pronouns. And I've been with the office since its inception 11 years ago. <laughs> Excited to be here with you as well. Yes. Um, I want us to take about a, a minute actually to ground ourselves. Um, and what I like to do is um, invite people to take an intentional um, breath and pause. And how we do that is if you feel comfortable, um, you can close your eyes, which I am going to do that. <laughs> and just take a moment to be intentional in this moment by listening to the sounds around you and the body automatically wants to just take a deep breath and so if that feels comfortable to you um, you can just you know take deep breaths or take um, breaths at your own pace And why do we do that? So we do this to slow down. We, look, we do this to be intentional in being here together and recognizing that um, 
we are in this space together and we're all breathing together in a very intentional way. So it's a way of doing our welcome <laughs> uh, in a very limited time that we have. Um, I also going, I'm going to encourage you that if, um, sorry, open your eyes. <laughs> it's like, uh, I am going to encourage you that throughout our training uh, to please take care of yourself. Um, if you need to get up and stretch, we welcome that. If you need to drink water, um, if you just need to take a deep breath because some of this information may be uh, triggering or may be difficult to, uh, maybe difficult to digest, have yourself to rely on and, and also um, uh, take care of yourself. So with that said, I am going to pass it on to uh, Judith, who is going to talk a, a little bit about why are we here, what is our approach, um, and how we're gonna spend our time in the next uh, two hours. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, we are excited to be here. I've got, okay, yes, there we go. Um, so the Office of Equity and Human Rights in the city of Portland's approach is to make systemic change. The issues are systemic that we need to deal with. So it's moving beyond just improving services or programs to really transforming the institution, the structures, the policies, the procedures, cultural norms, the beliefs, attitudes, you know, the whole shebang, basically. Um, and when we're talking about racial, racial equity, we're talking about when race doesn't determine or predict the distribution of resources, opportunities, and burdens for group members in society. So in other words, because you live in Portland and you're black, you are not more likely than white kids to end up not graduating high school. So that's what we mean when we talk about um, not that your race does not predict your outcome. Um, and, and so, uh, we'll also say something about, we will be talking about race. Um, hopefully I'm not jumping ahead too much, but we will be looking at race, but our office, we have LGBTQIA+, we have disability, we have, you know, we care about all the folks who have been historically oppressed and marginalized. Um, but we have found that if we don't talk about race, it doesn't get talked about, right? I mean, I think we can see, right, it's the third rail something even more electorate now in our country, but it's something so uh, uh, challenging for people to pay attention to. So we wanna make sure we don't lose track of that. So in our office, as I said, we do education and training. Yolanda's our, our manager of that um, work and we do civil rights title six um, work. We aren't a title six, we aren't a civil rights office, but we do have a civil rights title six program. Um, we do language access. So, um, this has been, and during the emergency, you know, with the COVID, we had several of our staff were working full time with the, with the um, emergency folks to try to make sure that everyone, regardless of language, um, was able to get what they needed to make it through the, 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 you know, shutdown when people didn't have access. We have the um, ADA Title II program, um, and we have LGBTQIA plus. Um, policy. We just got our second person um, who is working with that. So excited about that. We have the Black Male Achievement Program. That was a program that was started. It was before Obama was elected and started his My Brother's Keeper program. And this was started by the national organization and the idea really being like um, bringing together Black men to kind of work on what do we need to provide for Black men, Black youth to be able to achieve and to thrive in Portland. And we have not, that has not had a staff person in it for a while, but we're redoing that. And it historically had 23 people on its steering committee, which is big. And it also uh, ran a summer program for youth that was very popular and um, very successful. And then we do a lot of like, we do, um, technical advisement. Um, that's part of what I do. Um, I've worked with the smart cities um, folks and we have gotten privacy principles. We ban facial recognition technology and um, we just passed a surveillance policy, which we were excited, it took 18 months, but thank you. And that requires um, any technology that can be used for surveillance goes through a privacy risk assessment. So, and those will be public so people can see what is the risk to the community of their privacy um, 
being invaded by things like this, and then also a full inventory of all of the all of the technology that the city owns that has that capability. So um, it's a pretty good thing. So back in um, back when Juneteenth, so I think it's three years ago now, three years and a couple of months, our first Juneteenth, um, the city adopted some core values. And um, those, it's what you see on this, on this screen. So um, anti-racism was the first one that got listed. We were excited to see the city make this strong, um, this, this strong stand because anti-racism just means we're committed to disrupting racism. We're, we're just, we like to also talk about othering. We're, we're, we're committed to disrupting that. And, and disruption does not have to be a violent act or a, or a really you know, confrontational act. We also talk about calling people in. Um, so, so, but being intentional about that. It also um, has a lot to do with understanding if any of you've heard the term about anti-Black racism. And that is a core issue in this country. And it is a, it is the, it is the core of what we need to reckon with. Um, so that that is something we want to be really explicit about as well. Um, equity as we've described. So the equity work is basically to make sure everybody has whatever they need to get to the same outcome, right? Um, can we go back one second? I'm sorry. And then with transparency, communication, collaboration, all those things actually are things that you need to do to have equity and anti-racism. So they really all come together. Thank you. So again, our, you see on the slide, you know, it's when everyone has access to the opportunities um, to satisfy their essential needs, advance well-being, and achieve their full potential. And anti-racism is the proactive and consistent action against racial hatred, racial bias, and systemic racism. So one of the things that we um, do is we really recognize how we all have implicit bias. Is everyone familiar with implicit bias? So the idea that we are, you know, we, we, have, we have a lot of thoughts going on that are not coming to the surface for us. We're taking in so much information. So we know that, and we know we tend to default toward what is familiar. We tend to default toward what we understand. And uh, so we use some center, we use, some, I'm sorry, a series of questions. We call them equity analyst question, analysis questions or critical, uh, equity questions. And the idea is to make sure that we're always paying attention to whose view is being centered, right? What, what, what are the assumptions we're coming in with and whose culture are they based on? Um, and also recognizing whose view is not being considered in whatever room we're in. Um, and then really looking at who's going to be, who benefits and who is harmed by a policy program or a decision that's made. Um, so you recognize where that happens. And, you know, Portland has a long history where you can look at things that happen that clearly targeted and harmed the black community. There's a lot of um, evidence around what has happened um, there. And uh, so, you know, our goal is to try to not only not add harm, but we also want to do restoration and repair. Um, and then also understanding what are the historical relationships with the impacted communities? Um, and that again goes to what, you know, where have we been with folks? Um, and because to really understand the people we serve as a jurisdiction, we need to understand what their experience of government has been. Um, and we need to start with where they are with that. And as we know, there are a lot of communities that don't trust us because they have, you know, for good reason, they have not had good reasons to trust the government. They have not felt like they've had their needs met. So needing to understand that so that because that cultural sense within a community also is something that needs to be addressed when you're thinking about how do you create environments where everyone can thrive? And then what do we do about disparities? You know, do we have the opportunity to do some remediation? Do we have an opportunity to make things better? So uh, these are just a few examples of, um, of some of the ways of the history of racism in Portland. Uh, you know, the, the historic 
the historic racist land use planning contributed to the segregation and inequality uh, for people of color in Portland, uh, construction of I-5, Memorial Coliseum, and Emanuel Hospital contributed to the destruction of the Black neighborhood in Portland, and the KKK had access and influence on city elected officials at one point in the city that was well known. Um, I would really recommend there, did you, it's in the, re the references, the, why are there so few Black people in the city, yes. And one of the things I was just speaking with our city attorney about was looking at like Lentz and that area. Um, I had the honor of uh, facilitating when I was a, a consultant, the first few years of the urban renewal plan work out there. And um, one of the things that was clear, you know, there was the Mount Hood Freeway. That was another, you know, project um, that left a lot of mistrust in its path. And the, there was also now, if you look, that's an area where a lot of people of color, people that don't have money have been pushed into. And a lot of that area was annexed with promises of um, infrastructure that would be delivered um, because I was asking if that would be considered historic harm and indeed it would. And it's now impacting you know, everyone there. But um, that's one of the things we have to recognize. So, um, because the city did say, we're, you know, we'll bring you in, we'll give you sidewalks, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. And still many of those things don't exist in those areas. So the goal around uh, public participation is to involve the public um, and ensure that the public concerns and aspirations are consistently understood and considered. And I would say bring the public in at the earliest possible time. Um, you know, when you begin talking about something, it has been traditional to sort of have it all worked out and then go and say, what do you think of this? Um, but, but really, um, our idea is that really uh, good public participation that's really equitable would mean that we're bringing people in to help us do all the thinking about it. Um, be collaborative, you know, partner with the public in each aspect of the decision making process. This doesn't mean that every decision has to be done by consensus with the community, but what it means is number one, you need to be transparent about what your expectations are. So if you're coming to the community and that what you need from them is a consultation, but you will actually be making the decision independently. You just need to be upfront about that in the beginning. And whenever possible, it's great. I mean, when I think about um, consensus building, it's everybody has all the information they need and everybody gets a say in, in sort of what kind of decisions you make. Um, and that it's empowering, um, that the, the, the community does have um, the power to make final decisions. I think the Charter Commission, um, that you know, there the the was a good example of the community using that power through the charter commission, then being able to take the ballot measure to um, the the people people voted for. So that really was in in the hands of the public. Are we going to be able to get a copy of this? We can send it to you. Yeah, uh, we already did. Oh, okay. okay. I'll paste the link in the chat too. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, we also have to recognize the power imbalance, right? Um, and this, this totally goes back to every, a lot of the other things we've already said. The system was created by whom and for whom. You know, the system was created um, basically for white, Christian, able-bodied, cisgendered, you know, um, straight men. And, uh, and, and so, the system has persisted, right? It's like we laid the structure and foundation down and we, and then we fought to, to have other people considered and have other people have their needs met through that same system. But you can see that we have that in the middle and this is not about, you know, anything being wrong with being a straight white, you know, cisgendered Christian man. Um, but it's just that's who things were built for. So all these other people that you can see around these circle, you know, people of color, seniors, renters, um, people who are low income, people with disabilities, all these folks have been in the, have been othered, have been in the position where their needs are not primary for sure. Um, and I would say often not thought about, but, but I have a lot of I think there's been a lot of progress within the city of Portland in the work we've done. And I, and I am really pleased how often I see people think differently now, you know, about who's being impacted and how. Does that make sense to everybody? I like to say that 
uh, we are trying to expand uh, the circle of human concern because we're talking about people and humanity. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking about um, who is not in that circle of humanity is um, really having that intentional awareness of that we're all positioned very differently and we uh, navigate the world uh, very differently depending on our proximity to power. And um, one way to think about power, there's many ways <laughs> that, that we have um, access to power. Um, and power can be the ability to do something, the ability to influence the behaviors of others, the political power or being able to vote, right? There is many ways that that power can be exercised. Um, and in the work of equity and, and community engagement, um, it's important for us to start thinking about where power lies and how can we create um, policies, practices, procedures um, that gives access to power mm -hmm. to other community members, uh, to other groups of people that oftentimes um, have not been uh, given that opportunity. And we'll be talking more about this um, as we go forward. It's a very important piece. I see, David, you have your hand up. Are you there, David? You're muted if you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get my, my uh, get unlocked. I'm sorry, guys. No, I just, I had a question. So I, in my, in my professional life, I also teach DEI. That's one of the mm -hmm. things I do um, as a consultant with companies. And I'm hearing that you guys are saying that, you know, there, there, uh, there seems to be marvelous progress here in Portland, uh, particularly concerning people of color. I would like to know what you use as a barometer or, or a term of measurement to mm -hmm. make a claim like that. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying, I'm actually curious. No, it's a great question. It's a great question. So first of all, I want to say, I didn't say marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be hyperbolic here. Um, they got you. I got you. Um, and I would say, so internally, um, more staff has engaged in, in really, um, you know, insisting that their work is done in such a way that we are thinking about everyone we serve. Sometimes that can have big impacts, sometimes not as much. I mean, you can imagine, we're trying to change a 400 year old culture, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, we're sorry we haven't had it done in 11 years. We've really tried. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, the, but the other thing, David, is a great question is I would say, and this is what is so nice about getting old is that you have many decades to look at things. And I've been engaged in work around anti-racism for like four decades in the city. So okay. um, one of the things I've seen is if you look at things like um, Imagine Black, the Albina Project, the kind mm -hmm. of things that Rakaia Adams is doing, the way in which people are organizing, um, and I'm most familiar probably with the Black community around this, the mm -hmm. way that people have organized, created connections. Um, you know, I went to Say Hey, which uh, Partners in Diversity does. And, yep, I go um, to that yeah, every year too, ma'am. Yep. Yeah, so two two weeks ago, um, I went to the Say Hey event, and I started going to Say Hey when it was very new, and mm. there weren't as many people there, and this it was packed, packed. So for me, from my perspective as a white woman, but a white woman who pays attention to race, I see I see growth, on, and I will say a lot of it comes from the community, right? The way in which the community is organized. Um, you know, I personally think a lot of folks went off to school because thank you when we had affirmative action until just recently um, that people yeah. had more opportunities, right? So we have some like brilliant, highly educated folks who have invested in coming back to Portland. Thank goodness. So that's what I see. Oh, thank, I appreciate that. I was just, I was curious. Yeah. And yeah, you yeah. didn't say more. Marvelous, but I, I didn't take a note of that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to oversell because no, no, there's still obviously there's still that. obviously so much to do, and of course, right now it's really challenging because it feels like we're going backwards, you know. Yeah. So, um, and it does. Yeah. That's that's why I was like, how does she? What barometer is she using for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I don't want to gloss over. You know, we had two hate crimes over the Labor Day weekend that have been called mm -hmm. hate crimes that we know of. Two yep. young black boys, seventeen stabbed. 
and the max, right? And for with no provocation, because they were black. And think about it, that was just a couple of years ago, we had deaths on the, the only difference between what happened a couple of years ago is that, thank goodness, these young people didn't die. But, and then, um, you know, several instances of um, folks who, from Asian identity, who, who have been harassed terribly on the street. So we are not, you know, we're not in any kind of um, post-racial moment, for sure. Right. I appreciate right, right, the question, thanks. Thank you. Joe, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that we're here doing this training and I'm not sure that city advisory committees have been doing this for very long. I've worked with an awful lot of advisory committees through the years that haven't. Thank you, Joe. And you know, Joe and I have known each other for a long time as I was a consultant when he was still doing um, his business. And we've talked about this for a long time. If you remember when we were doing the um, comprehensive plan update um, and we started talking about this and um, so we've been at it a while. Um, yes, and so here's an example of, this is the city of Portland language list. So there's a whole calculation they do around uh, the language access program and they figure out how many um, people uh, of more than a thousand people speak a language primary, their primary language. So these are the languages that we always um, advise people to uh, translate materials into. Um, and, you know, I will say, you know, money is a real issue, right? Like being able to afford to do these things. We have asked people to start with their um, critical documents. The other thing is the, the um, plain language, which was an act that was passed by Congress. I can't remember the year, but it's really about making sure everyone, we try to shoot for a ninth grade reading level in what we write. We are nowhere near it. And I just was talking to the city attorney about code, right? Every Portlander should be reasonably be able to read the code and know what it is that they're expected to do under the code, right? So I'm laughing because I just read some code today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just saw some new code with there after there for there. I was like, I, I put it through Hemingway, which is really cool little program. And it was difficult, uh, extremely difficult to whatever impossible is to understand. Um, you, um, I provided to Julia uh, a resource page, um, and in there it has the information for um, the language access uh, program advisor, uh, um, Tatiana Elejalde, uh, from the Office of Equity and Human Rights. We have a lot of uh, subject matter experts that actually have that direct relationship and also some of them live experience with uh, specific communities. Um, we, um, when we talk about communities that are underserved, underrepresented, um, of course, we're talking about multilingual communities, multiracial, multiethnic, uh, people from different uh, uh, economic backgrounds. And we ourselves don't know it all, right? We, we may have some ideas about uh, certain histories about those communities, about certain needs, um, but we do have people that have, once again, that expertise in those communities. So I highly recommend um, to reach out to specific um, uh, experts of those communities to come and tell you a little bit more about, for example, how to work with multilingual communities, how to work with the LGBTQA yeah. plus community, how to work with the disability community. Um, and here we are, uh, a lot of knowledge about uh, working with multiracial, uh, uh, racial and racial justice, racial equity, um, and language is one, one of them, right? Access, uh, language access is, is very important. And language also, it's an opportunity for, to gain power, right? <laughs> Communication, language, uh, and being aware of, um, how to do that, uh, it's important, right? In that communication, in the language of what we're showing here, Spanish, <laughs> Vietnamese, Chinese, mm -hmm. Russian, Somali, Ukrainian, Romanian, Napoli, uh, Chukis, which we, I had to Google that. I was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, <laughs> where is <laughs> Chukis? Mm -hmm. So there's an island in Micronesia, mm -hmm. so, a lot of islands there. So it's a lot that we, um, that we're trying to learn and connect with communities. And I think that it's also important for us to know who are our neighbors, right? Who are our uh, 
who are the groups that we often um, connect with? Um, because oftentimes you are going to see that you are connecting to people that look like you, um, that have similar uh, values like you, um, that have uh, the language that you speak, right? Um, that maybe come from similar backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And that also limits us um, from expanding our knowledge and connections to other communities. Um, so that is why it's important for us to think about and say, who are uh, the communities that we, that we might need to uh, connect with and, and get to know more? Um, and with that said, I'm trying to gather my thoughts. <laughs> Being a multilingual person here. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of resources out there with how to connect with those communities. You don't have to do it alone and you don't have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, maybe many of you who have been active in community engagement and involvement are familiar already with those organizations. Um, there's community engagement liaisons. Um, and there is, if you want to work with immigrants and refugees and you are like, where do I start, right? There, there's, this is only one, the Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization. You want to work specifically with the Latinx, Latino, Latina community, there's Latino Network, there's a program Hispano, right? Uh, Office of Equity is a great resource for finding out what are the other um, networks out there? that can give me more data um, and more resources to reach out to community. Native people, uh, indigenous people, right? Um, Native American youth and family center, mm -hmm. one of them. The Somali American Council of Oregon, that's another one. And there's many more. Mm -hmm. So find out what organizations are out there that um, can help you, again, connect to, to those communities. I'm going to pause here okay. and see if um, any of you, Jamila or Judith, have any uh, thoughts. I would just say that it's important to remember, I mean, government has a lot of power, right? And it has a lot of power over our lives. And it's our job to serve every Portlander. That's really why we exist, you know? And the reason that you know, we, we don't serve people, all people well at this point, but, and we know that from disparity studies and others. And um, so our goal is to be able to serve every Portlander well. And um, I think that certainly should be a goal everyone would agree with for government. Um, and I bet you all do in this room and on the Zoom. Um, and, it, and I think, and you know, that means we have to disrupt some of our former ways of seeing each other and thinking about who gets what. Um, but I, I do, I think that, you know, the, the goal again um, is to be actively working on um, a city where everyone is within the circle of human concern. And I just wanna say about language, uh, my old friend Polo, who used to talk about the immigrant folks and refugee folks who came in, there will always be people who are freshly new and don't speak English at all. And so we always, we can't wait, we can't tell people, well, we'll, we'll get to you when you speak enough English or we'll get to you when you can come to our meetings, right? So that's what's, uh, Part that I always think of when I hear about language too. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Jamila? At this, point? I think the only thing I'd add is that, like Judith was saying, we have to serve all people, and the only way to serve people well is if we know what they need, mm -hmm. and the only way to know what they need is by letting them speak for themselves mm -hmm. in their own languages, in their own voice, um, in their own ways. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. So things to consider for that connection and that um, engagement uh, are cultural considerations. <laughs> so uh, Judith was talking about that. Uh, there is different acculturation process, right? Um, there is people who are uh, just arriving, right? And, and are learning the language and they may still be very skeptical and even, um, 
and even if they have been living here for years, <laughs> like, like me, right? Um, so there's also that cultural component too that um, people have different backgrounds and different um, acceptance of the traditions and the values of this country. They also bring a lot of diversity with their own values and culture and traditions. So there is a, an adaptation process um, that can also create barriers, right? Because it might be that um, it might take them a little bit of time for them to engage, right? Um, the other, the other one is about distrust of government and fear of authorities. Uh, we, Judith, talked about a lot, a lot about that, and about the history of just a um, lot of the government laws and policies were. Um, very intentional to discriminate against people because of their mm. color, their race, because of their gender, because of their um, uh, disability and so forth. So it has been very explicit in its past and its present. Um, the other uh, consideration is mixed immigration and citizen citizenship status. Um, so this is about political power, right? Um, with this new form of government, um, in order for uh, people to uh, participate, um, they have to have the ability to vote, right? Like they have to have the ability to be a, a US citizen. Um, and not every community that you will uh, come into contact with will have that privilege of being a US citizen. Um, you will have um, families and mixed households, mixed immigration status, where maybe um, um, parents um, may be still be in the process, right, of getting uh, the uh, documentation or, or residency or citizenship while the, while the children were born in the United States, right? And so, it's also important to consider that maybe um, even if you have people that are not having yet the voting rights or, or the citizenship status, um, that you will have other people within that family who are, and they do they do share values, you know, they do share um, communication, and in one way or another, they also tend to participate even when they might not have that citizenship status. Um, and yeah, the other, the other thing it's about traumatic experiences, um, trauma. This is where I'm gonna talk about trauma. So if you wanna like take a deep breath or throughout this next section, something is triggering for you, just make sure that you take time to take care of yourself. Um, so yeah, so we don't know what's going on in people's lives, right? There's a lot of things happening um, in our lives and around us and how that impacts uh, that could impact the engagement. Um, so, yeah, so one way to um, describe trauma is that they are um, experiences that uh, threaten or violate one's safety, health, and integrity. And that is up to the individual to decide that experience. Um, and there is different ways that um, that trauma is experience, and there is also different ways that people explain that experience. Some people may not even use the word trauma, and that's not something that they may connect with. Um, and so that is also okay to consider, like cultural, right? Um, and uh, yeah. So what are the different types of trauma? <laughs> um, so we have the acute, like the, uh, maybe a one-time one incident, uh, like a car accident um, that may have left a um, long lasting impact. Um, we have chronic trauma um, that is um, events that can uh, be ongoing, um, like domestic violence, um, there is complex trauma that it is a combination <laughs> of many uh, traumatic experiences, um, child neglect and abandonment. Um, 
and historic trauma, which is slavery, Holocaust, forced migration, and there's an intergenerational alcohol and drug in addiction. So this is just some examples. Um, and And those are just examples also to just remind us about our humanity again, because we're showing up in spaces um, mm -hmm. that are require of us to, uh, to be professionals or, or to um, practice certain uh, behaviors. And, uh, and sometimes there is a lot of things that are happening that we don't know of and that can create responses in the moment. Um, with engagement. And um, I noticed in the chat that sure. um, William added re-trauma, add mental health. And of course, trauma can impact your mental health and having certain mental illnesses can be traumatic and create trauma for uh, yourself and your loved ones sometimes. If you, did you wanna say anything more about that, William, or just make sure we're making that connection? You captured the connection. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Judith, for watching over the chat and everything. Yes. And of course, trauma is also, um, it disconnects us and mental health, taking care of our mental health. I try my best. That's why at the beginning of this training, it's like, let's just take a minute to pause and close our eyes and reconnect with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just take that one minute in um, trying to be intentional. And um, it's a practice <laughs> that we're, we're trying to implement with um, the Office of Equity and trying to create new ways to um, promote mental health and also promote um, connection, human connection. Um, Judith or Jamila, would you like to cover the next section about what do I why do I need to know about trauma? Why do I need to know this? <laughs> I would say one reason is when we're working with community, one of the things about trauma is that like, it, and if somebody's feeling triggered, you, you become emotionally dysregulated. And uh, so I facilitate a lot of community meetings in my time. And now that I know more about trauma, I can look back and see where some participants that I honestly would have thought of as difficult, now I can see that there was something else going on with them. And sometimes it had to, and sometimes it's not even related to anything you're talking about, right? So that can be really hard. And I would just add that I, I think we need to know about trauma because I think we've all been traumatized by the virus, by what's going on in our world. I think everyone is experiencing some amount of, you know, um, stress that can feel like chronic trauma to a lot of people. Um, but when you, so when you think about how are you planning meetings, how are you relating to people, you know, it's being thoughtful about, um, about uh, building trust, understanding that takes time. Um, and if you are not acknowledging, you know, if you are in a meeting, sometimes talking about things that have historically been hard for communities can, can be traumatizing to some people, but for some people having it ignored feels traumatizing because it's just another layer of the invisibility that they have experienced so much in their experience in the community. So it there it's not a straight line, right? It can be tricky and it, it's sort of, um, but it's important that we understand that, that you know, this is an impact on folks and, and know about that. Jamila, do you want anything? Yeah, I think it's important to start with the understanding that we're all living with some baseline of like residual trauma just by virtue of like living in this culture and living in this society where we're so disconnected from ourselves and from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think once we acknowledge that, we're able to understand that, like if I think, I was a classroom teacher for a long time. And so a lot of the behaviors that show up in classrooms that people often say like, oh, a student is being disruptive or a student is being rude or a student is failing to engage. Oftentimes those are trauma responses. And so when we're able to approach each other and approach situations with the understanding that without making us assumptions about people's engagement or the way that we feel like folks should be engaging, we're better able to understand and make room for people to sort of show up in their full selves. And so, 
I think that was like really fundamental for me as a teacher to realize oh, like this isn't personal. People are showing up with their own with their own baggage, with their own issues. Good point. Can uh -oh. we use your charger, Yolanda? <laughs> Can we what? Can, Can we, we use, use your charger? charger? <laughs> yes. We're offline for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can go grab that one. Okay, we'll probably make it through, but thank you. You've been so helpful. Yeah, and this is a moment where I'm gonna invite you that to take a moment to just take a deep breath or just um, drink water oh, if you or coffee, tea, whatever mm -hmm. you may have. Stretch. <laughs> Stretch. Okay. Um, so what are some of the ways that we can um, practice uh, trauma-informed uh, trauma-informed practices. Uh, like Jamila was explaining that oftentimes we tend to blame individuals for their behavior, like going on that moment and making a judgment um, about that behavior for that moment without looking at context, without really looking at what's going on, curiosity in, in this person's life. And Practicing that trauma-informed mindset kind of as, is asking of us to think about, instead of saying what is wrong with you, to switch, shift that to what has happened to you and what do you need? And that takes a lot of courage to actually be able to, to take a moment and say, okay, what has happened to you and what do you need? What do you need? Because a lot of the times our response is to also be defensive, right? Or protect ourselves. If someone is, uh, it's been expressing anger, expressing, um, and, and expressing their anger by uh, raising their voice mm -hmm. or by leaving the situation, storming out, right? Those are behaviors that are not acceptable, right? In, in a professional settings or in a usual, um, uh, community setting, right? And it's, it's difficult and it's uncomfortable, right? To be in that space. And um, oftentimes, so once again, how do we move from what is wrong with you to mm -hmm. what has happened to you? Um, reduce harm, uh, nothing about us without us. Um, the people that have been harmed um, know better of how, uh, of what they need. So it's with that understanding of instead of being the savior in a way of like, I'm going to rescue you, it's most likely like um, you are the impacted person with trust that you are the expert and guide us in um, how we can reduce harm. Um, meet people where they are. Um, and some people say, leave people, meet people where they are, but don't leave them there sometimes, mm -hmm. right? And so yes, it's and, and uh, both, you know, both this and mm -hmm. that. Um, and just thinking about that they're doing their best they can with the conditions and resources that they have. Um, and it's easy to say, and I know that, and it takes a lot of practice to actually be able to be in that mindset of uh, trauma informed. Use people-centered language. Um, we like to practice here at the Office of Equity being very intentional about the language, right? Instead of saying um, a person, um, like someone is, uh, someone, I'm so used to saying someone because I'm person centered. So uh, mental, the mentally ill, right? Like we are disconnecting that mentally ill from actually a person. So um, whenever it's possible, try to include a person with mental illness, right? Um, a houseless person, not just um, someone who is black, we always said like a black person, right? Um, so how do we bring that humanity in the way that we're speaking about um, the different people, the different groups and include 
uh, people or person as much as possible. I just, can I, I you know me, I hate to, I have to inject stories. Um, I just recently heard someone was talking about um, being questioned about, you know, was their event accessible? And they said, oh, we only got one request from a wheelchair. <laughs> I bet it was the person using a wheelchair. So that's another example of where people, you know, dehumanize. It's dehumanizing to say that that's your identity rather than that it's something that is an aspect of you. Yes. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. Get your flow. I, I actually love when 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 you step in. Um, I see Jose uh, raising yeah. their hand. Yes. Uh, I was just going to ask, what about, um, I've heard a lot from disability groups recently uh, about using the word disabled instead of saying pe person with disabilities, and they're using the word disabled to reference themselves. Um, do you, how, why have you heard about that? I've heard that too, Jose, and I, I think there's um, there's as many ways to think about it as there are people who are engaged in, um, and you know, there's a lot of people who are engaged in what they call the social model um, of disability that says there's nothing wrong with us. It's that the society is not built for us, and it's the it's that's the problem. Um, and there are other folks. I mean, I think the people-centered language. It's really helpful, but there are people who say, you know, um, exactly like you say, I, I don't have a problem with that. I have a disability. Um, you can call me disabled. So there is a lot of um, feeling. And I think the most important thing is use the most respectful language that you're aware of. And then if you're corrected, just immediately say, thank you for correcting me and use the correction. Yeah, I think best practice is letting people as often as possible self-identify. Mm -hmm. And that's the same actually for a lot of things around um, pronouns and other, you know, other ways of just allowing people to speak to who they are. Yeah, and language continues to evolve. Mm -hmm. So it's, it may change uh, and that's okay. And um, yeah, and people also claim, reclaim some groups of people are also reclaiming mm -hmm. an identity that maybe was considered derogatory uh, before. Um, like the word queer, for example. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's but it's that group of people who get to decide, right? Mm -hmm. Do they want to claim, um, reclaim that that word um, back? And yes, there's controversy everywhere. <laughs> Truly, yeah, really people have a lot of different feelings about a lot of things. Yes. So, um, remove participation barriers. That's uh, another one, mm -hmm. trauma informed, and that's a continuous improvement process. And we're going to be giving you more examples about how to bring in very specific. So now that you're saying those principles, mindset, well, so what do we do? What are some of the practices? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and the historical harm around, around data, it's a lot of that information that. Um, an example is like uh, the African American com community being uh, used as research subjects without without their consent, and there mm -hmm. has been a lot of medical experiments done on on the African American mm -hmm. community, men um, and women, and there has been a lot of trauma around around mm -hmm. that uh, historical trauma around um, the the trust in government and in, in, in the medical field. Mm -hmm. So um, there are things to consider about institutions and, and, and data. Mm -hmm. So here's where we come Joe to the Santa. Yeah, I want to know if this is a comment or a question or a lament, but somebody said earlier, I think maybe Judith, that um, building trust takes time. And the best way to engage people is to have authentic long-term relationships with them. And we just had the almost um, case study and how not to do that with the um, Independent Districting Commission that you know worked their hearts out and were incredibly committed, mm -hmm. but were just basically thrown out there mm -hmm. and told, okay, you know, meet with these people and mm -hmm. you know, engage them. 
and now we're sort of starting over again. And I think the, the, the complaint is that, you know, the city has had ample opportunities going back to at least Vision PDX and maybe before that to build long-term authentic relationships with community-based organizations and with people in those communities. And instead it's okay, well, we need engagement to check the box. So here we are, I'm from the city and I'm here to engage you. And I'm, you know, the latest in a long line of people and you know who they are, but I don't even know who they are. And it feels like we're being, I mean, our, our, our engagement plan and, and values in it, I think are just great, but we're not in a position to actualize that. Right. We're just sort of getting thrown into it once again. And some of us happen to have ongoing relationships mm -hmm. that we can build on, mm -hmm. but somehow every effort has to start over. And you know, I, I will say this is my opinion only, it's not, it's not been um, certified or approved by the city of Portland, is that um, I think a couple of things, well, you notice, you know, what was the office of neighborhood involvement and then civic life has shrunk and our commitment, I think to, I mean, it was one of the things I was very proud of in Portland and loved that I really felt like we had a commitment to the community, not just engagement, but really deliberative democracy, really bringing people in, really hearing voices. That that seems to have um, not, does not seem to have the same value right now. Um, and you're right, you know, we bring in different people. And I think one of the things that I'm hopeful for in the change of government is there won't be as much political upset, right? Because you, what you get is new projects and, you know, like I said, Joe and I were around for vision into action and then the Portland plan, and then it became the, you know, comprehensive plan update. But also what happens when new people are elected, they don't always want to attach to the thing the last person did. So sometimes long-term planning is very frustrating. So I think that as well, and you know, you have my sympathies and my thanks for what you're doing to be here because it is really important, but I also know that it's been a frustrating process for a lot of folks. Um, and yeah, it is, it, we are far from perfect in it. There's this, Yolanda, we talked beforehand and I said, you know, we're gonna go in and talk about, this is ideally how the city thinks it needs to be done to people are experiencing and not being done that way. And so, you know, we, I just wanna say that we are aware of that, um, juxtaposition and that that this is this is our north star. I can't seem to raise my digital hand, but <laughs> fortunately, you have a real live one right here. Yeah, right? It's so convenient. But I've served on a number of city committees, mm -hmm. and I will say that this one is better. It's not perfect, mm -hmm. but I mean, the way I was shut down in past committees was really. Uh, why was I even there? I yeah. wondered. And in this one, I feel like at least it's going somewhere. Yeah. So. That's great to hear. Yeah. I know a lot of us are really grateful that you all are willing to serve in this capacity because it's really important. You know, we're in, we're in a historic moment and I think everyone's worked really hard to do the very best they can do. And we're, you know, it's, um, I keep telling people it's kind of like Mr. Toad's wild rides. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> so Yolanda, you were about to talk about some more ways yeah. to think about just, you know. And this is maybe an opportunity to also collect the wisdom of this, of this group as well, mm -hmm. of like engagement practices that you have seen uh, or that you practice that um, have made you feel that really aligns with the values of creating that culture of belonging, inclusion, and equity. Uh, we're, we're gonna give you some examples and then you can, this is a moment where you can participate. So one, as you know, is it's pronouns. Um, it, it's important to um, see people for who they are and we cannot make uh, assumptions about people's gender by the way that they look or uh, their names um, and how they're presenting. So sharing pronouns is um, an inclusive practice and um, not making it 
uh, a, a mandatory or like something that they have to force and, and share it, it's, it's trauma informed because not everyone feels um, safe and feels comfortable sharing that information. Not everyone is going through the same transition mm -hmm. about their identity. Um, so that is why um, we often, when we ask for this piece of information, we, we, we tell people, like, if you feel comfortable, you know, um, share your pronouns. Um, when in doubt, um, and you don't know pronouns, um, uh, gender neutral pronouns. And that's a practice that I'm constantly trying to, to do. Um, um, it's always a continuous improvement process because we tend to do the default, right? Um, the other thing is about food options and distribution. I'm not sure how much engagement you will be doing in person. Um, besides food options, um, I once went to a community engagement event and I really appreciated the order of uh, food distribution, food sharing, where um, they would um, ask people who you know have family who have children or who may need more time in gathering their food to actually go first and that's like it might seem like a simple practice right like it's like of course we've seen that but you will be surprised of how many community engagement events where food is shared um that that it's not happening i have a dad who has some mobility challenges and navigating uh, spaces with him has actually given me a lot of insights, mm -hmm. right? Of what is it, what is it to be in a body that requires more care? So, so making even that that practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even having some uh, reserve sitting areas, right? Because sometimes you go to a community event, and it takes you some time to get there by finding the place, mm -hmm. transportation challenges, blah blah blah. And by the time you get there. If again, if you have some challenges with um, caring for yourself and your body and you get there in this north city, sitting uh, uh, available. Mm -hmm. So how do we create a, a seating arrangements for family and kids, for people, um, older, older adults and uh, people with different, uh, with disabilities. Um, microphone usage. <laughs> microphone usage. How often do your people say, oh, I don't need it, right? Yes, they do. <laughs> we open, I open like to share with people. It's like, it's actually not for us. It's for the people uh, in, uh, it's for people here. It's because it's showing that we care about the people who are actually in the room and it's not about us. Mm -hmm. And microphone usage is something that um, I've learned that it's not about just using the microphone, but also knowing how to use it, uh, right? Uh, we, uh, uh, we all, I, I, I'm going to, we all get scared by the microphone. We get intimidated with the mm -hmm. microphone, many of us. So um, oftentimes it's not just about the microphone, we're just reminding people, right? Mm -hmm. Like, please get it closer to your mouth. And sometimes I do that with Judith, like remember Judith, like we have to be reminding each other as yeah. we're using the microphone. And, and we have, Janet, we have the tip also that if you're in it, you know, if you're in a situation where there's a lot of people want to talk and you know some people, don't let go of the microphone. Hold it up, hold it up to them. Um, but that is learned through hard lessons through many things I've facilitated where it's like, come on, come on, give me that. <laughs> Not a good look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Avoid that. Yeah. And as you as you're, you know, the host, you're you're the you're hosting an event, you have a lot of power in setting um the culture in that moment, right? And um oftentimes uh, it's a good reminder for us when we're facilitating is like we get to set that culture. And mm -hmm. so it's important for us to model, model what we want to see. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. We're always trying to improve. And, um, and we, 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 uh, we start with small steps. Sometimes uh, it doesn't require um, a lot of work or preparation to start implementing some of those uh, practices. The other one is minimize the use of initialisms and acronyms. Mm -hmm. We are the city of acronyms and initialisms, <laughs> right? Um, so that creates a lot of language barriers, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
So when, whenever possible, right, if you're gonna use an initialism, an acronym, make sure that you are explaining what that means at the beginning um, and also, uh, it's it's important for people who are multilingual. There is a lot of interpreters that you may use, and it's sometimes initialisms and acronyms don't translate well in other languages. Um, we also, of course, have a lot of people that are just not familiar with the acronyms and acronyms and initialisms. So it's as simple as that. Uh, sometimes we don't even doesn't even cross our mind. Um, and uh, so that's one way to start thinking about like, how do we create practices where people feel more like they are also part of, of the, the culture, um, that they belong. Allow pauses and silences. That's something that I'm practicing in Espanol. In Spanish, I speak really fast. I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. In English, I have to remember that sometimes that doesn't work well with me. So it's important for me to slow down and allow for pauses and silences um, so that I can uh, support other learning and listening um, abilities. So Jamila, uh, Judith, this is your time to share and then we'll open it to the, to the group. Yeah, let me gather my thoughts. For okay. A well, I will then say the pauses and silences. I remember learning a big lesson about that culturally there are different expectations around pauses. And I remember learning from a native um, man who was a social worker who talked about going in to observe and there was somebody who uh, they had, the, the social worker people had decided that this mom was not um, engaged in the son's treatment, like was not paying attention, was not willing to you know, engage. And so he like watched through a one-way mirror to watch the interaction. And then, you know, and the woman say, so, you know, what do you think about that? So, I mean, do you agree? Well, do you have another way to do it? And he said, you never stop talking long enough for her to know you were done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've learned that. I mean, I talked in a family that you had to talk before the sentence was done. <laughs> I mean, it was a jump, it was like this. And so I have to watch it for myself. But that's an important thing to remember. Different cultures have different senses of that pause. And sometimes that is the case that people don't know you're done talking until you let the silence sit there for a minute. They know you're, you're completed it. And I think those moments of silence are so important because sometimes as facilitators, we panic and we think that, mm -hmm. oh no, like it's quiet, but that gives people a time, a chance to reflect, mm -hmm. a chance to process, like a chance to sort of sit there with mm -hmm. their thoughts. And so not being afraid of silence and thinking mm -hmm. of silence as something fruitful and potentially productive. Um, and I think the use of initialisms and acronyms is really important too, because I mean, I'm new to the city of Portland and like Yolanda was saying, there's 10 million acronyms for everything. <laughs> and I don't know, what, half the time, I don't know what people are talking about just yet. And so when we rely on initials and acronyms, we make assumptions about what people in the room already know. Mm -hmm. And so when we make those assumptions, sort of the gap between people gets wider. And so mm -hmm. our goal, again, is always to sort of reduce that gap in power between people. And it's hard for people to say, I don't know. I mean, it's really hard. It's hard to be the one to say it again and again. Um, I remember in Lens, I, I, we, you know, I would notice that we'd all be seeming to be on the same page. And then suddenly there would be a hard stop in terms of the community's agreement. And I later figured out people started talking about things in a way that they felt like they didn't understand. And they'd rather say no than agree to something that they didn't understand. So that helped me as a facilitator understand where I need to say, you know, would you like to know more about that? But take that, taking that pressure off of people to not have, it's the same thing actually with the microphone, right? Not if you, if you say, can everybody hear me? It, but a lot of people, you know, there's stigma around stuff. People don't want to say I'm hard of hearing or I can't, you know? So that's one of the things to remember too, is it's hard for people to jump up and be the one who becomes the outlier. Yeah, I am wondering if any of you have I'm sure you have a lot of ideas too, Joe. I mean, you're deeply got, experienced in this. I got two people. Oh, you do? Good. You have answer. So we're going to start with Amy and then Leah. 
Um, okay, I'm trying to form this thought, but um, I'm interested in like, as far as trauma informed engagement goes. So there's obviously the historical traumas and understanding those dynamics, but there's also like a lot of really recent conflict in Portland that we've recently experienced and is still kind of present and fresh, including things like the city council trying to deter this process and, um, you know, the just things that are happening presently and in the last few years. I recently saw a film of the, the um, riots, protests that have been happening. And um, it feels, I'm just curious, what is the trauma-informed way to acknowledge trauma that's like presently unfolding in a way that's not gonna be like um, detrimental to the cause, you know? Like obviously we wanna build um, <laughs> partnership as speakers, but it feels a bit disingenuous to say, trust the city now, but don't look at any of the stuff the city right. is presently doing. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the tipping point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I saw that on Saturday and I was like, this is right now. <laughs> yeah. This I, I highly recommend it. Election it. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. About our time with the Black Lives Matter and everything that was going on. And uh, all all the filming is done by folks who were out live streaming. Um, is I thought it was well done. It was a, it's very thought provoking. Well, I will just say for me, it's being transparent and acknowledging. And I generally, you know, if I go into a situation and there's a lot of conflict, I like to acknowledge the conflict right off the bat and say, I know there's a lot of conflict here. I know people feel can have feel some very different ways about this. And, um, you know, I know there's strong feelings about it. And, um, you know, strong feelings are welcome here. And, you know, sometimes I may ask you to step back, take a breath, you know, do to, to, to like kind of take a moment right before um, if you, if a if it's becoming disruptive, right? So for me, that's my that's my plan is just tell the truth. We know there's division, right? And we know that that it's a place that, but I, I think most of us don't want to stay divided, right? And so I always think and name it and then the goal, right? What do you what do you all think? What do other people think? Yeah, I'd agree. I think the most important thing is to to validate that, to acknowledge it, and to bring it into the room because it's explicitly, because it's already there, whether you're speaking on it or not. And I think sometimes we think that if we don't acknowledge something, it doesn't exist, but failing to acknowledge the reality that people are living in and dealing with right now does the opposite of what we're trying to do. Like that actually serves to erode trust and to make it difficult for people to connect. And so to acknowledge it head on, I think makes connection easier and more meaningful and more authentic. Yeah, and I think that it requires, um, if you are the presenter, you're the host, you're the person leading the, the space to for one to be comfortable with that discomfort because I feel like personally like I know myself um, and oftentimes I can get triggered of just talking about hey you know it's it's, it's difficult it's it's violence and blah 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 and using certain words that I know that can be triggering and can be heavy um, and so watching also in my body like when I'm like okay I know that. The, I'm not that I'm going to go into a meeting <laughs> that is going to be a difficult uh, situation and I have to address a recent event that just happened. And so I have to actually prepare myself too, because mm -hmm. I have to be also be okay with bringing it up, bringing the elephant in the room. And we are wired to avoid conflict. We're about wired to maybe try to protect ourselves. So a lot of the times it's just getting ourselves just ready to say it's okay. We're gonna be okay. And just reminding people that you have a community, right? Take care of yourself, whatever that looks like for you. And that's why I try to tell people like, take care of yourselves, but whatever that looks looks for you, right? Uh, rely on your community. So um, it's that, <laughs> like talking about this, but also giving them something and not just leaving them in with, this is the, this is the elephant and there, there it is. So. I think we got three hands up. Yay. Leah, Joe, and then David. Does that look like the right order? Um, I'll hop in. Where's yeah. everybody? <laughs> I'm here. I'm Leah. She, they. Yay. Um, I, 
I wanted to say all of this is really great. And I wanted to also offer some perspective on engagement about thinking before people show up in the room. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, there's so many directions to go in with that. But one that comes to mind a lot with city stuff is socioeconomic status or class mm -hmm. when we're talking about this. Who actually is able to show up? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that shows up in a lot of different ways that I consider. One of them being when we're planning things. For many, many years, I worked at a bike shop, which meant I worked until 7.30 in the evening and on weekends. But there's the assumption that if you show up to things like this, you have a white collar job that's Monday to Friday, nine to five. And it's really difficult to engage if you exist outside of that. And so when we're planning things really makes a difference in terms of who we're inviting to the table, but also taking into account the, the cost of volunteering your time mm -hmm. and what a privilege it is, like whether it's, you know, having um, enough money or resources to travel to where you need to go, mm -hmm. having enough money for childcare, um, just having the space in your mm -hmm. like time and day to be able to offer it. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I don't know, everyone's doing their best, but sometimes it means that by offering these engagement, we're just offering people with enough like privilege, mm -hmm. especially financial privilege mm -hmm. to be able to show up. So I'm always curious about like, are there ways, you know, can we provide travel vouchers? Can we pay mm -hmm. people for their time? You know, can we do this at like creative hours mm -hmm. so that we're including people that don't just work nine to five? And the answer is yes to several of those questions. Yeah. I mean, we have... And we are constantly relooking at the usage of, you know, vouchers. And not surprisingly, I think sort of during the pandemic, it was get everything out. People were in desperate need, right? And then now it's like, did we get everyone's name? And it, it, it looked out of control. But um, we are still trying to figure out exactly what we have a pause on gift cards right now, right? But there's a couple of things. One thing I think is is um, partnering with organizations that serve communities that might, you know, um, that already that there's comfort there and it's also a trusted resource for you to be with. And then, so like we will pay an organization to be the convener of something. And then they also can make decisions about food, about compensation for people. And we don't have to worry as much about that. And yes, I, I've always seen that we have TriMet vouchers. We have other ways we've, we've gotten lift rides for people for some of the committees. Um, and, and so, you know, those things, there's still awkward things. I think like childcare, I always felt like, well, that's great if you have childcare, but I don't want to take my, you know, six-year-old out at seven at night that they need to be in bed. Um, we are now, you know, is, we're going to be doing many more hybrid meetings. And I think that's helpful too, but really great thought. Yeah. And I, to your point about hybrid meetings, I think it is so great for so much of this. But the other thing that comes to mind with equity there is that we're making assumptions now about people's um, comfort with technology. Yeah. And the we're working that on that. You own a computer, you know, <laughs> yeah. like I think it wasn't a stated um, requirement for GTAC, but I think we've all realized mm -hmm. like we, you yeah. need one, you know? Um, so just, I don't know. I know that that's like a tough nut to crack, but just something to consider. Is like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And if you have that, I, I, we often recommend to do meetings um, at two at different times, right? So with Smart City, the project we've done, I'm really proud of the way we've done our community engagement. And so we'll have like something on a Saturday, but then something on like a, a weeknight, you know, um, to try to make sure we can capture a couple different. I love the participation and we have uh, five more people. So I would love to hear from them. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I think you're next. I can help make this shorter. Oops. Unmute. Mute. <laughs> so I can help make this shorter because it's like you guys have been reading my notes. It says child care, transportation, work with community based organizations and pay them for their time. And ideally, if they care about what we want to talk about, they're going to get their people out. Mm -hmm. They're going to know what those people need in order mm -hmm. to participate fully. And I think a lot of this comes down to budget. And I don't know, too, maybe you do, do we have a budget to really be able to do the things we're talking about? Because if we do, it's going to make a world of difference. We can get back to you. It's no on the bus pass. Mm -hmm. I already got that. Really? Uh huh. So if you need any backup on making sure you're able to do equitable engagement, let us know because we can um, we can put some um, words in around that. 
I guess I, I want to say something a little bit different, and that is um, we all come to this with really different uh, experience, expertise, um, you know, perspectives, and that's why why we're here. That's why this group was sort of formed to bring our, our different things to the table. Some of us have a lot of experience doing community engagement, and I hope that we're able. Thank you. Uh, William. Oh, uh, thank you. I wonder whether you uh, could give some thought or comment on a couple, I, I, I'm I would perceive sources of resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, one would be a concern of that WASHPIS group in your first slide about loss of status. And I think there can be an art counter argument that it might be loss of, rel you know, inclusion might be loss of relative status, but it doesn't mean loss of status. It instead means raising everyone up to, you know, a good status. Uh, and there could be an argument that it is in the social and economic interest that everyone could do that. I welcome your comments on that. Another one, another, I think, source of resistance is a perception of individualism or rugged individualism and saying that the Washburn's group has benefited from, you know, you know, benefits before. That's not going to address the resistance. So, I, I welcome your comments, or and this probably requires a lot of deliberation. <laughs> so, I, I, I'll raise those and welcome your thoughts. Trying to hold back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we deal with resistance every day um, in our work, and I think some of it is um, and. Uh, coming from being a mediator, um, also Jamila has a lot of experience in that area as well. Um, you need to validate where people are first because people at, will present their where they are in their position, but we really try to get to the interest, you know? And so I think to, to, to recognize that, that um, first of all, to listen to folks, right? And, and hear what their concern is. Um, I agree with you, William, that we are all better off. Um, and it is a problem that we have this individualism and this rugged individualism, um, even though it seems to me everything we're learning in science and everything else just keeps showing how connected we are. Um, so for, for me, part of it is if you're in a group and someone's being very resistant, one of my strategies is don't center the resistance, right? Acknowledge, understand that you feel this way. Um, you know, you, you may not agree with me in the end, but um, I, I'd like the opportunity to um, be heard, right? Hear me out. Um, and so a lot of this comes when we do our equity one-on-one training with folks. And for us also, we, we make it clear that, you know, it, whatever your individualism is, um, the reality is that, um, you know, especially because we're working in government, that, you uh, Everybody does better when everybody does better. It just is makes sense, right? We're we're not our city is not benefiting by the level of poverty that we're experiencing on the streets now. We're not, you know, we 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 have to lift together. Um, but mostly for me, it's not getting too reactive, acknowledging people's feelings about it. And sometimes I'll say to people, I'm happy to have a conversation with you later, you know, if that becomes disruptive. But yeah. There's, and I think there's fear, right? There's a sense, but it's not, I mean, I think about middle-class white men are, have an epidemic of suicide, right? Nobody, nobody's happy, right? And part of the, part of also, I was hearing recently that somebody really started the conversation around class and that that actually was an entree to get to race because for a lot of folks, I mean, you think about a lot of working class folks who are feeling resistant around conversations about equity and equality and uh, all of those things are actually have exactly the same outcome needs that we want for other communities. You know, so, so, you know, we want people to be able to organize. We want people around their needs. We want people to have access to health care. We want people to be able to buy their home, to 
you know, send their kids to college. Like that's, I think we can find the values and interests that we all share together. Thank you, Judith. I really love the engagement. We're just gonna go with Jamie and Amy and then we're gonna move on to the next uh, topic about facilitation. Cause this is about mm -hmm. talking about facilitation and how do we do, do that in a way that is equitable and is also uh, trauma informed. So Jane. Oh, thank you very much. I'll be brief. Um, uh, less than a week ago, I was fortunate to be able to go to the Old Town Chinatown Community Association to sort of give an update on where we are with this new government transition plan. And I went, I went earlier than my, my time because I wasn't quite sure how to get there. And as I sat in the room, there were maybe 50 people there and 50 people on Zoom. Um, people are royally ticked off. I mean, and you can imagine if you were in Old Town Chinatown, you would be having a tough time. Um, and that's what I listened to for quite a long time. So, um, yeah, here I was going to come up and talk a little bit about, you know, what's new with the city when they had been quite verbose about how they really did not like the city. So, um, so here's the good news. The good news is that because I really wasn't a city person, but I was representing the Government Transition Advisory Commission, and I was more like them, I was a community person. First of all, that gave me some trust banking, and they and they turned. You could almost feel it in the presentation that they turned. So I think that um, we're in a great position. We think that we're not in a great position, but, uh, but we are in a great position to have this message and to particularly car carry the banner for something new and different. And that's where the hope is. So I think I look at my, you know, all of my team members here as, as being the hopeful banner carriers. So please go and do that. But the fun thing that came out of this was not only how people dislike initials and acronisms, they really, really laugh because I kept jumping slides because I said to them, oh no, that's city speak. The slide was so convoluted, not just, it didn't have any acronyms and, and, and initials in it, but there is a full, a way that planning organizations talk. I used to work for the Port of Portland. We talk the same to people the way that the city does. So one of the things I think we have to be cognizant of is that we have to you know, talk like real people. Um, so that's going to be a little bit of challenge with our, our materials, but I think we're in a great place and I'm finding all of this super, super helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your um, insight. Um, Amy. I'll be quick so Zach can have a moment because he hasn't spoken yet. Um, I just want to name our lack of media outreach and proactive media strategy mm -hmm. as an equity issue um, because uh, with full support to the media folks, they're awesome and they have a great plan and we haven't heard yet kind of what they have on deck, but the more energy we put into those like non-traditional media streams like podcasting, um, whatever, local radio stations, mm -hmm. um, individual shows, the more we as a committee put energy into them putting energy into it. They're incredibly talented professionals who know what they're doing. And as much as we can put our weight as a committee behind them doing media outreach, um, it's an equity issue. Nice, great point. Thank you. Zach, you will be the last person. Okay. I know that you had only designated to, so thanks for the extra time, Yolanda. Um, so, I, you know, I'm thinking about how to go about trauma-informed engagement when we're asking ourselves to meet people who have historically not been connected in government and we're doing something that's kind of technocratic in a lot of ways and it's a challenge and I, I just am recognizing that challenge and something I had promised a while back that I have not fulfilled but to provide us as a committee some materials that are kind of round, like very foundational mm -hmm. civic engagement tools, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise we're coming in with the expectation and assumption that people understand, you know, what the what a charter is mm -hmm. and what <laughs> like how government operates. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's like a really important piece, both in the like 
responsibility that we own of helping people, you know, all all ships rise with the tide kind of mentality, but also in, you know, acknowledging that the that there might be trauma based in like steeped in that um, mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, if you're talking about the, you know, access to a vote, like we were talking about before, or it, it can, it can be a very challenging environment. And so one of the, the um, things that I've learned, I have not had the opportunity to implement in this um, committee, but is to do as much ground truthing to what, information is being sought for after mm -hmm. before actually being in that space nice. you can sometimes access that with the the organizer not always it's mm -hmm. not something to rely on because often they are more connected than mm -hmm. the people who show up um but to what to extent that you can adapt to that room ahead of time gives you a lot more opportunity to build trust and meet people where they are mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Right. Love it. Thank you so much for your engagement and participation. And uh, the floor is yours, Shamila. So it's been really exciting to hear everyone's, everyone's insight. I'm really appreciative of everyone's engagement and participation. And so as we transition a little bit to talk specifically about trauma-informed facilitation, I think I want to start by saying that trauma-informed facilitation practices are generally just best practices for facilitating in general. And so regardless of who's in the room, by focusing on connection and focusing on care as a facilitator, um, that's gonna be best practices regardless of who, who's in the room. And so when we think about facilitation, we can split it up by thinking about things that you can do to prepare beforehand, things that you can do during the actual facilitation process, and then things that you can have in place afterwards. And so some considerations for before facilitating is to start by thinking about who the best person to facilitate is going to be based on identity, perhaps based on on prior connection to the community, um, perhaps based on prior work experience or history, all of those things are gonna be useful in helping to determine who the best person to facilitate is going to be. And then thinking about who the audience is going to be as you sort of prepare to think about content. So who's gonna be in the room? What are the needs of the people that are in the room? And if you don't know, who can you ask to find out? And then thinking a little creatively about content. How can I make sure that the content that I'm sharing is going to be inclusive, that it's going to be accessible? Um, I think it was Jane who was saying earlier that there were some slides that were like, just they might not have been using initials and acronyms, acronyms, but that it was city speak. And so how do we make sure that the content that we're sharing is going, that people are going to understand what it is that we're saying? Because engagement isn't just talking at people, it's talking to people, it's talking with people and giving people a chance to talk back. And so even about, it's the chance to be creative when we're thinking about how we're putting content together, um, making space for the different ways that people access and process information. And so maybe perhaps not relying exclusively on text, but thinking of ways to incorporate maybe music, maybe movement, maybe video. Um, so just giving people different doors to walk through to access whatever information it is that we're hoping to communicate and share. And then some things to do during the actual facilitation process that are that go a long way towards building trust and building relationship. And the first is to have clear objectives and that sometimes we have objectives as facilitators and we don't always communicate what those objectives are to the people that are in the room. And so making just making folks a more active participant in the process is always going to be really important. Having an agenda and sharing that agenda with people so that they know what to expect. And then it goes a long way towards building trust to follow through on that agenda. And so to be careful and thoughtful about time management and things like that to make sure that whatever it is that you, you told people to show up for is what's actually going to happen in the space. Um, it's also going to be important 
to create opportunities for participants to learn and process in affinity groups, perhaps. There was a question I think William asked earlier about ways to deal with resistance or disruption. And so one of the ways to sort of not necessarily contain resistance, but to make sure that folks are having conversations with people that maybe they have, that they're more on the same page as, is to give people the opportunity or the option to process information or engage in conversation in affinity groups divest from a culture of expertise and utilize the wisdom in the room is going to be really important, especially when working with an engaging community. So not, not assuming that we're experts on anything, not assuming that we're in a role to teach anyone anything, but that we're trying to engage in a process of co-learning and making space for people to share what they're thinking and what they already know and taking that information and that sharing seri just as seriously as whatever information or content it is that we're delivering and sharing. And then whenever we bring people together, there's always a chance that someone might say something offensive, whether it's intentional or unintentional, doesn't matter as much. But as, fa as facilitators, being responsible for maintaining the integrity of the space. And by that, I mean interrupting harm when it happens mm -hmm. and attending to impact over intent. And so that's not to say that someone's intentions are irrelevant. Intentions matter, of course, but the impact, especially on, it's just, it's important to center the most impacted in that situation. And then what sometimes we think that, okay, the engagement is over, like the event or this talk that I was facilitating is over, but it's not. And so how can we make sure that we're still being trauma informed even after the event is over? And one is to provide resources. So whether that's opportunities for continued learning, whether it's resources that were sort of mentioned in whatever it is that you were sharing, making sure that people have a way to access it. It could even be like printing things out ahead of time so that folks can take things with them instead of assuming people have access, like go online and go to a website. Um, providing opportunities for participants to debrief, whether that's in small groups, whether that's with facilitators, um, and then giving people an opportunity to share their feedback with facilitators. Um, and I think sometimes like I've been at events where at the end of the event, someone will be like, oh, like here's a link to a survey to like give us your feedback on this survey as we're walking out the door. Mm -hmm. And so if we think that people's, we want to show people that we value what they say, that we value what they're thinking, that we value their feedback. And the way to do that is to build time into our, into whatever it is that we're facilitating for people to give us that feedback and then to take that feedback very seriously. And so to figure out how we can refine our future facilitation practices based on that feedback. William had a comment. He'd like to know what we meant by um, debrief and infinity groups. Can you describe affinity groups? That's a really good question. Yeah, and sorry for, making an assumption that we sort of all have an understanding of what it, what affinity groups mean. Um, I'm talking about, yeah, it's the option of allowing people to discuss in small groups, and that can be oftentimes like a racial affinity group. And so giving people of color an opportunity to debrief or discuss something together, giving white folks an opportunity to debrief and discuss together. And it's not to say that like, cross-racial learning isn't important. It is, absolutely. But if perhaps we're talking about something more sensitive, um, then giving people the opportunity to share in sort of a more protected space, or if it's a situation where we feel like there might be a lot more resistance, then giving folks an opportunity to process maybe in a white affinity group mm -hmm. in a place that won't be harmful to folks of color in the space um, might be is often like a really a helpful way to sort of structure the time and the space. We have recently encountered folks who have said that they feel like the affinity groups are discriminatory and um, create segregation. And um, so, you know, for us, our way, our process is you, you, everyone can be wherever they need to be, right? But you kind of create the space um, with the explanation of what you're doing and hope that people will join in. But when we've um, recently come up against that, it's one of the things that we've talked to attorneys and others about is what, what is our obligation and, you know, it is that, that anyone can join. So it gets a little trickier, but um, it can be very helpful to, you know, and it depends on the room you're in too, right? And who's right. gonna, if you have a lot of young people, you wanna maybe have young people have their own group because they tend to not get, 
the, you know, to talk when there's adults in the, you know, in the group. So you can think differently about where do you create a space that people feel most comfortable to speak. Uh, yeah, affinity groups share experience, groups that have shared experience, and language is one of them. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of, mm -hmm. when you do an engagement, multilingual mm -hmm. people that will feel more comfortable being with other Spanish-speaking countries, uh, Spanish-speaking right. people. Right. Um, sometimes you might just get one or two, two people, persons, but it's okay. So think about that as well. Anything else? I ask like within practice of thinking about the affinity groups because I do like that the idea of it allows kind of group think in a way of like confidence and trust within a group to be able to speak to what interests them or what they are concerned about and um, so in organizing our meetings with, with community it's it's often well, at least I, I found so far kind of like a 45 minute, 50 minute, which maybe is hard and to, it's not necessarily conducive to doing that, but I'm curious if maybe it's like a well-trodden path that I'm just completely oblivious to of like, you know, a way of incorporating that really mm -hmm. powerful skill mm -hmm. to into a, a 45 minute kind of mm -hmm. way of engaging a community. Um, or maybe there's like, lessons that others on the committee, if they've done this before, but I'd be really interested. Because I do think like with these students, like I'm, I'm trying to reach out to like Reed and Lewis and Clark and getting, getting students. And like, I think that's going to be really like a, a, a most valuable way of engaging with that, that uh, group because they often are working in groups and teams. Um, but I don't know how to do that with it, like a 45 minutes. <laughs> this will sound like it's maybe not going directly to that, but one of the things I've found is that it really helps to get everybody's voice in the room in the very beginning. And so that's why I like doing some kind of icebreaker. And usually I like to have it in a dyad, two people with each other, so that everyone's voice is being heard originally. And I do find that that somehow breaks the ice in a way that it's more, that you have more people willing to sort of contribute. It relaxes sort of the, I don't know what it is exactly. I can feel it happen, but I don't know exactly how to describe what happens. So even though that's not about how do you create an affinity group, I think if you can think of a question, right? Or, you know, I'd like to know what you think about this, or how do you see yourself participating? Um, how would you, um, um, how would you describe, you know, um, thinking about how would you pass the word to others to make sure that people are engaged and making sure their vote counts. Some of that, you know, like stuff like that. So if you have a meaningful question, it doesn't have to be long. Sometimes our, our groups are, you know, eight minutes in our trainings. That's my thought. Yeah, and I think, I mean, 45 minutes is not a long time and it's still 45 minutes. Yeah. And so sometimes it just means like being really creative and thoughtful about how you structure meetings and time with people and so i think a lot of times we like fall into a routine where we do the same thing every single meeting and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case and so it can be as simple as like if it's an in-person meeting having like poster boards set up that have like maybe one says students and so asking people to sit next to like the poster board that as they're walking in that they feel most like aligned with and so yeah, I think it's just going to require like being creative in terms of how we how we engage people and not feeling beholden to the way that like we're comfortable or not regularly do things. Yeah. Um, and with your topic, that could be things like what district are you from? Like, totally. you know, and okay. we actually saw that at the, at the IDC, some of those meetings where it was, I think, well, it was like adding your inputs on certain aspects of it or like what your favorite um, map was or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't have to be high fluid. I mean, people tend to sit next to the people that they know already. Yeah. So, you know, could you just take five minutes and how about if you three talk, you three talk, we three right. talk, ask a question. Right. And then as Judith says, once you've spoken once, it's a lot easier to speak a second mm -hmm. time. So the easier you make it yeah. to speak the first time, the easier it's going to be for people later on. How about that? Thank you. There's a good organizing saying, be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Um, 
set the temperature of the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ten till. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Time check. Right, go ahead. Do you want one more? Well, I, I think a lot about <clears throat> historic birth documentation and training, and I think about different learning styles. <clears throat> so there's visual, mm -hmm. that's me, auditory. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing that. Most of these meetings, we have something to look at and we're hearing it, but there's mm -hmm. also tactile. Jamila, mm -hmm. you probably know these better than I do. So I, I like to try to address those, you know, provide some kind of tabletop exercise. And that can also kind of, um, you know, diffuse some of that tension or uh, reticence to engage in other formats. Um, and then I also don't want to forget about all the people who are afraid to speak in public mm -hmm. because I used to be one of them. It took me a long time to work through that and all the people who have had their ideas dismissed. Mm -hmm. It's happened to me many times. So um, I always like to provide the opportunity to write an anonymous or you can put your name on it too, but to write a comment and submit it. And when I was a city manager, I always had an anonymous suggestion box mm -hmm. outside my office because there are people and you cannot expect everyone mm -hmm. to come to a meeting and speak in public mm -hmm. and they may be afraid that their ideas will be shut down because mm -hmm. it's happened to them before. Yeah, it's pretty excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, speaking of stretching and like kind of in different ways of learning how about we if you're able you can stand up and i'm gonna stand up myself and i'm just gonna do a stretch which what i like to do is just like to raise my both of my hands up to the sky that feels really nice on my back and then it's just a tendency oh, that the yeah. body it's just like uh and then just take a big Thank breath. You. Mm. Oh, wow. And then, we, and yeah, then, the, body, that, and then the body automatically <laughs> wants to move and it wants to go from side to side sometimes or Whatever feels comfortable for you, just for a few seconds here. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have um, a, I don't know how much how many minutes you need for the for the end for the closing. Oh, but like one. Just one minute. <laughs> yeah. um, we can always wrap up earlier, right? We don't have to use every single minute. So maybe just take a little pause and see if people have any final comments, uh, questions. Yeah, it's a long day, right? For some <laughs> yes. resources. So I, since it doesn't seem like people have any comments, we are here as a resource. Um, it's also a lot of resources that we shared uh, with Julia, and I hope that that can be uh, distributed in one way or another. Um, I don't know if the two of you have any other resources that you want to add. Um, but it, it, only just as what. Joe said early on, you have so much knowledge in this group. It's really uh, wonderful. And so, you know, you've probably already figured out each other is a giant resource um, for, your, for your learning. And like Yolanda said, we are around, you know, you can reach out to us if we can be helpful. Yeah. I think we've also agreed to go in pairs, which- I was wondering about that. Great. I was thinking that would be smart. <laughs> And if it's a particularly challenging group, you know, some of us who have more facilitation mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. and experience working with challenging groups could take that on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be part of that affinity group. <laughs> Anything? I just thank you again for your service yes. to the city in this way. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And um, really appreciative, both personally and from, I know, the importance is somebody was saying you went and you weren't you weren't from the city so that really helped I think I think that was Jane and um you know I know how that works and it's great so thank you so much everybody yeah thank you everyone you you do have a lot of power even if it may seem that in moments you don't but um invite you to try to find where that power that you have because you do have a lot thank you so much everyone Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, and before we wrap up, I just want to do some next steps. So again, this meeting is being recorded so folks who haven't been able to watch it or if there are pieces you wanted to rewatch, that will be up on our website. Um, and our next committee meeting is, is next, next Wednesday, September 20th. And so you'll see um, materials for that tomorrow. 
And, you know, there were some things that were talked about here, for example, uh, maybe what you talked about with media and Joe about resources and budget for some of the best practices we talked about. Um, and so I think those are things we can come back to you all with or, you know, just kind of continue to keep in mind. So thank you all for being here. Um, and that is the end of our special meeting today. So thanks for bringing so, that thank here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being so engaged. <laughs> So Juliet, I'm yeah. finished making it. Give you five minutes back. I was like, oh my <laughs> 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 <laughs>